Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Leap Lisbon seminar. Today, we have the pleasure to have the, a seminar by Guilherme Guedes. Guilherme is doing his PhD with Nuno Castro at the Leap Minho and uh, in the, also in the, together with the University of Granada. He's working on the technology of composite Higgs models. And today he's going to present us his latest article, just accepted in the European Physics Journal C. Congratulations. Uh, the article is entitled uh, Running in the Alps. Thank you, Guilherme, for being here, and you may start whenever you wish. Okay, so thanks for the, the introduction, Huben, and thanks for the opportunity to present my, my work here. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, scare you with the title. We're, all, we're not actually going for, for a run. We're just going to discuss the normalization group equations of uh, the standard model effective field theory extended with uh, an axion-like particle that we will call the, the ALP. Uh, so as Ruben said, this is based on a paper that was recently published and was done in collaboration with Mikhail Chawa, Maria Ramos, and Rosa Santiago. Maria Ramos is also a PhD student here at LIP, and Mikhail Chawa and Rosa Santiago are professors at the University of Granada. So I'm going to start with a brief uh, theoretical introduction on the concepts of effective field theory and their normalization group equations. Uh, and the, the importance of using them in order to correctly interpret the experimental bounds that we obtain on these particles. And then I'm going to go in more detail into the calculation of these renormalization group equations. And then at the end, uh, I'll show how using this, uh, uh, this running of the couplings can give us uh, much stronger bounds than when we use the, only the direct uh, direct bounds. So let me start with a, a brief introduction to effective field theory. As we know, we have yet to see a, a significant deviation from the, from the standard model. And so it is uh, normal to consider that uh, a scale of new physics would lie at energies much larger than the electroweak scale. So this allows us to think of the standard model as an effective field theory. So the low energy uh, manif manifestation, the low energy limit of a more fundamental UV description, which would have unknown uh, uh, physics. We consider the, the effective field theory, the standard model as an effective field theory because we're going to parameterize the effects of this unknown physics into operators which are only constru constructed with the degrees of freedom of the accessible scale the, uh, by experiments. In this case, the standard model, degrees of freedom. So by doing this, we can study uh, the low energy effects of UV physics without committing to a specific model, uh, a specific UV completion, and only searching for, de for deviations uh, from the standard model. One of the most famous examples of a, a successful effective field theory approach is the Fermi theory, in which even before knowing about the existence of electric cage bosons, one could, uh, so in a theory with only light fermions, one could study the interaction of four fermions with this uh, contact interaction, which is described by this uh, higher dimensional operator. And it was very su successful at describing, for example, the, the mu one lifetime. Uh, however, as we went to higher energies, this description eventually breaks down since we are uh, approaching uh, new physics. And we understood that this interaction was actually being mediated by a heavy uh, gauge boson, which we were effectively integrating out. To, to fix this coefficient here of this effective operator, one needs to perform the matching procedure. That is, at a certain scale, we're going to require that the effective theory reproduces the results of the full theory. And so we fix the result of this coefficient at that uh, particular scale. As I mentioned, this, uh, the, the high energy effects are going to be parameterized into higher dimensional operators that as such are, will come suppressed by powers of the, the high energy scale, this lambda here. So for higher dimensions, we get further suppression. So in, in principle, this will be less important. There's been a lot of work done in the, in the standard model effective field theory with the operators at dimension six being completely constructed and classified, and even the normalization group equations all been uh, calculated. More recently, there's also been some work done uh, up to dimension eight. However, if there are uh, new states uh, that exist below the electroweak scale, then one would need to extend this, the SMEFT approach to include 
all the operators that could be constructed with, with this extra uh, degree of freedom. And one of the most motivated uh, uh, fields to include in this uh, uh, below the electric scale are axion-like particles. Axion-like particles are standard model gauge singlets, which are pseudo-scalars. So they are odd and they are scalars which are odd and their CP transformation. Uh, and they are very uh, theoretically motivated, uh, mainly through the axion itself, which uh, arises to solve the strong CP problem. So the fact that we do not observe CP violation in a strong sector. And the, the axion was, uh, was theorized as a pseudo Golson, which arises from a spontaneously broken U1 symmetry. And as it takes a wave, it can cancel the contribution for, for this uh, theta parameter and explain why we do not observe uh, CP violation in the strong sector. Uh, other motivations come from uh, composite Higgs models in which uh, in the same vein as the Higgs is considered a pseudo Golson that arises from a spontaneously broken global symmetry at the TeV scale. So can other uh, singlets arise in this uh, spontaneously broken symmetry. And here I show some of the symmetry patterns which can give rise to extra singlets besides the, the Higgs. Also in dark matter models, uh, the pseudoscalar is uh, sometimes considered to be the mediator between the dark sector and the, the standard model sector, since it allows for a suppression of the cross-section processes, uh, of the uh, suppression of the cross-section of direct detection processes, and so allow the evasion of these strong uh, constraints. There are also uh, several anomalies which can be explained uh, with the use of pseudoscalar, for example, the G minus two of the muon. Well, given this uh, wide motivation, the experimental program that searches for these sort of particles searches for a wide range of masses and couplings. And more importantly, these experiments are performed at very different energy scales. Uh, for instance, if we look at this plot for heavier axions, we see that most constraints come from collider physics, for instance, at the LHC with a uh, center of mass energy of 13 TeV. Whereas if we go for lighter axions, the best constraints come from uh, cosmology or astrophysical uh, probes, which can, uh, one which will focus on in this, uh, in this work will be the, the anomalous cooling of red giants. And this will, will takes place at around the KeV scale. So we see that since we're working with such different energy scales, it's very important to know how do the couplings of the, of the ALP uh, vary with energy. And also very interestingly, how, they, how do these couplings mix among themselves, which can have interesting phenomenological results as we will see uh, in, the, in the next slide. And this, this, uh, this, will be, this, will, this running and mixing will follow the corresponding renormalization group equations which is exactly what we aim to, to calculate in this work. There's been a lot of work done uh, in the phenomenal phenomenology of ALPS. And there has also been some partial results calculating the normalization group equations in these uh, references that I, that I show here. However, and to the best of our, of our knowledge, there was not yet uh, a systematic approach to the calculation of these uh, normalization group equations. And so our, our main goal was to provide the full calculation uh, of the anomalous dimension matrix up to dimension five at one loop, including all couplings at, uh, at dimension five, but also the running of the dimension four couplings of the axion like particle and the Higgs. We also choose a slightly different basis than what is usually uh, used in the literature. And uh, we'll also talk about the comparison between these two, these two bases and the subtleties uh, in regards to shift symmetry breaking and invariance. And then given that, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, there are a lot of experiments that also run uh, energies below the electric scale. We will also perform the, the running below the electric scale after integrating out the Z, the Higgs, the top uh, and the W. And we will match this theory uh, to the theory, to the SMEF with extended with the ALP. So to start uh, our, cal our calculations, we need then to construct the, the basis of operators, which we will work with up to dimension five, as I mentioned. Uh, here, we do not have to worry about uh, operators pu constructed purely from the standard model because at dimension five, we only have the Weinberg operator, which is left the number violating. And so we will neglect it. 
And we will also assume that all new physics or all the new operators that we include are CP even. Uh, this choice is uh, radiatively stable uh, and can only, but up to the, the, the CP odd phase in the, in the Yukawas. So we could, in principle, generate the CP odd operators uh, with this insertion. However, for now, we will neglect this and maybe work on it in a, a future paper. So this is the complete uh, green, green basis of operators that we use. Here in the left, we have the non-redundant operators, whereas in the right, the redundant ones, which are related uh, to the previous ones by employing the equations of motion. So the, the, the results that we are interested in will be uh, presented in terms of the non-redundant basis. However, which we show all the intermediate calculations uh, using the redundant ones, since if one wants to expand on, our, on the work that we did, for example, include other particles uh, below the electric scale or extend to higher dimensions, then one needs to have these results so that it doesn't have to recalculate them from the start. So focusing then on the non-redundant basis, we have here three Yukawa-like uh, operators that couple the ALP to the, the Higgs and the fermions and three operators which couple the, the up to the gauge bosons. These are all Hermitian operators, we wrote in Hermitian, so that the coefficient that follows them is, are, is real. So here in, this Yukawa, in the Yukawa-like operators, we'll have real matrices in uh, flavor space, and here real numbers. As I mentioned, these are only CP even. We will also have each of these operators as a CP odd count counterpart, which is of the, a very similar uh, structure. We follow the, to construct these spaces, we follow the Warsaw uh, basis spirit in the sense that we have uh, very little derivatives. However, in the, in the literature, it's common to use uh, a different basis. This basis here, uh, which uses the, uh, the derivative acting on the ALP. And they use this because, as I mentioned in the theoretical motivation for this particle, it is usually considered to be a uh, a pseudo Goldstone, so it comes with an approximate shift symmetry. And so it is common to choose these spaces because this shift symmetry is more explicit with the derivative acting uh, directly on the ALP. So let us compare uh, this, uh, this choice of spaces with the choice that we, we did, that we had the Yukawa like operators. Uh, let me just point out that this uh, psi goes over all uh, chiral fermions, and this C psi, this coupling, are Hermitian matrices. So let's look just uh, to start at the left and sec sector to make it easier to compare both bases. And in the left and sector, if we look at this at these spaces, we see that we'll have two Hermitian matri matrices, one for the left-handed leptons and one for the right-handed. And so we'll have nine plus nine independent parameters in this space. In, in, uh, in our bases, the, remember that the Yukawa-like operators came with real uh, real matrices. And so we will have nine parameters from the CP even uh, Yukawa like operator and another nine, of nine coefficients uh, from the CP odd operator that, as I told you, was uh, very similar in structure to the CP even one. So everything seems fine for now. We have 18 parameters in both, in both bases, so they seem to be equivalent. However, when we look uh, at this, at this, at this, uh, at these spaces, we, we immediately see that it only can represent shift symmetric operators by the by definition. Whereas the Yukawa-like operators can represent both shift symmetric and both and shift breaking uh, operators. So it seems that with the same amount of parameters, we can reproduce more uh, operators, and so it seems to be the more minimal one. However, at first sight, it might not be clear how the, the Yukawa-like operators can respect shift symmetry because they don't have the, the derivative. However, in, the, in our paper, we show that performing the appropriate chiral, chiral rotations, we can get rid of these extra terms that comes from the shift. And we show the necessary conditions to ensure that the, the operator respects uh, shift symmetry. And we show them here, both for the coupling of the CP even operator and for the CP odd one. Um, these here H are um, uh, arbitrary emission matrices. So now that we have this, now that we know how to enforce shift symmetry in our basis, then we can again 
compare with the, the previous basis, now we're in, in equal footing since both are describing only shift symmetric uh, operators. And what we see is that going again to a more, more simple case in the limit of one lepton family, so that this counting is much easier, we see that we cannot have the CPO uh, coupling because we cannot have the imaginary part of a one by one Hermitian matrix. A matrix, so we will only have one independent parameter which will come from the CPUs and the coefficients. Whereas looking back at, uh, at the shift symmetric basis, we still have one parameter for each of the C of the C matrix matrix. So we have one parameter in the Eukalyak basis versus two. So again, the the minimality of the basis that we use becomes more apparent here, and the shift the explicitly shift symmetric basis seems to be over redundant. Okay, so we'll, with the basis all sorted out, now we can go uh, to the calculation of the renormalization group equations. Uh, the renormalization group equations come from the, from the fact that at the loop level, we, generate, we can generate uh, divergences with our, with our bare Lagrangian. So here I'm just showing a very simple Lagrangian with a kinetic and the, and the quartic term for the, for the alt. And here this zero represents that I'm working with bare quantities. So these uh, infinities that are generated at loop level, we do not observe them. So we want to, want to get only finite uh, observables. And what we do is that we, we rescale these, the fields and the, and the coupling, the bare coupling, with these z, z factors. We'll also include here this mass scale because we're working in dimensional regularization, which uh, turns the dimension of the Lagrangian to four minus two epsilon. And so we need to include this, this mass scale to, to keep the coefficient dimension. Um, so after uh, rescaling the fields and coefficients, we get this, uh, this Lagrangian, which will have the first part, which is very similar to the, to the previous one. And this one, which we will call the counter terms, which have the Z, the Z factors coming from the rescaling. And we'll calculate these Z factors so that they cancel the, the, the divergences that are generated in one loop. So that in, at the end, we only get finite uh, observable, which is exactly what we want. So after, to do this, doing this, we also can implement a, a condition, which is the fact that the bare coupling, the coupling that we started off, cannot depend on the mass scale that we introduce. And so this uh, relation, will, this differential equation, will give us the renormalization group uh, equation. When we su uh, substitute the, the bare coupling, we see that we're, got, we're going to have here the dependence on the z. So indeed, we need to calculate the renormalization group equations. We need to calculate the divergences that are generated uh, in this case at one loop. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to compute uh, the divergences uh, generated at one loop. And, and we'll be worried with divergences which come from the insertion of one effective operator. So we'll go, we're going to be going up to uh, one over lambda, where lambda is the high energy scale, up to order one over lambda in our calculations. And then these divergences that we include are going to be absorbed by the operators, both the redundant and non-redundant, and we'll turn the redundant ones into the non-redundant through equations of motion, as I mentioned before. So to perform this calculation, we used uh, a plethora of softwares, fine rules to, uh, to write the model and get the Feynman rules, and then fine arts to generate the diagrams and form calf, which automatically calculates to this divergent part. We also did a manual check to check if everything was going well, again, using fine holes and QGraph, which draw, drew the, the diagrams that we needed to, to manually calculate. Let me just give you an example of this, uh, of this process. And here I'm going to show you the process of the ALP, which we'll call S, going to phi phi dagger. Here phi is the Higgs doublet. And these are all the divergences, that the, the diagrams that can be generated at one loop with one insertion of a dimension five uh, operator, uh, here represented by these gray vertices. So we calculate the, 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 the amplitude of this, the divergent part of the amplitude of, this, uh, of these loops, and we get this result here. Note here that this trace on the, the flavor space of the Yukawa's and the, the Yukawa-like uh, operator comes, sorry, 
from this uh, loop diagram in which inside the loop we have all families of uh, fermions uh, running. And uh, so here in the, in the amplitude that we calculate, we see that it comes proportional to a kinematic structure, this P2 squared minus P3 squared. And so we'll want to see which effective operator can uh, absorb this divergence. And we see that it is in fact a redundant operator that produces this, uh, that at tree level produces this kinematic structure. And it's this RS5 box. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll calculate what RS5 box uh, needs to be in order to cancel exactly these divergences that we generated at one loop. And after figuring out what, what the value of this coefficient must be, then we translate it into the non-redundant basis by the use of equations of motion. So we use here the equations of motion and we see that we're going to get contributions to the Yukawa-like uh, operators, which were in the non-redundant basis. Another uh, very interesting uh, aspect that becomes clear in this diagrammatic uh, approach is the fact of mixing between the effective operators. So let's look at the, this process S5 dagger going to the left-handed quark and the right-handed up, up quark. The divergences from this uh, operator are going to be absorbed by the Yukawa-like up operator, which I show here. And uh, I'm showing here some of the diagrams that contribute to- yeah, the... Can I ask you a question? Sure, sure. Can you, can you go back? Um, when, when you say, um, so if I understand this correctly, you get the infinities um, that are proportional to this kinematic factor. Mm -hmm. And then you go uh, and pick up the, the operator that has the same kinematic factor. But uh, what I did not understand is, uh, do you use it later or is this just, I mean, it would be equivalent just to throw away the infinity. What, what, what do you need this, this uh, operator for? Will he use it later? Uh, so yeah, so we we want to know exactly what this uh, because th this R coefficient is the represents the Z factor that I mentioned before. So they will be important to calculate uh, the normalization group equations. Okay, so this this is the way uh, to to match the 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 Z factors that you have to to use for the for the RGs. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here, you, you know, I was talking about here the, the mixing. So in this, uh, the, the processes that contribute to this, uh, that are going to be absorbed by this operator, can have diagrams with insertions of other effective operators. So here I show some diagrams in which here we have the insertion of the Yukawa like down operator, and here as well. And here the insertion of the coupling of the up to gauge bosons. So what this means and the, the consequence at the, the, the phenomenological level is that we can start with a, an effective coupling that is zero. For instance, let us assume that we start with the Yukawa like up operator being zero, but through uh, running through these divergences that are generated, we can generate this, uh, this coupling uh, given that other couplings are non-zero. This will become more clear when we look at, uh, at the phenomenological implications. So after calculating all of this divergence, we get again the, we'll get our, our Lagrangian with the divergent part, which we will write like this. Each operator will come with a, a divergent coefficient, uh, which again, the goal is to cancel the divergences that come from one loop. But this coefficient here, this A prime that I write here, through mixing does not have to be exactly the same, uh, the coupling corresponding to the effective operator. So here, this uh, CNM matrix, the off diagonal terms represent mixing between the effective operators. So with this uh, calculated, and now we're ready to actually calculate the normalization group equations. Here we'll define the beta function in this way. And uh, after applying, uh, uh, we use here a master formula to calculate the, the speed of functions and we get to this result in which after factorizing the, um, the effective couplings, we get this gamma NM matrix, which is the anomalous dimension matrix. 
The anomalous dimension matrix is constructed with the, the CNM matrix that I showed before, this matrix here. And also it will have uh, contributions from the wave function renormalization of the fields that constitute the, the operator. So basically, if we're looking at, uh, again, the Yukawa-like uh, up operator, we, we need to include the, the wave, wave function normalization of each of the external legs of this diagram. And these uh, Z factors of the wave function normalization come from, the, from absorbing the divergences in the kinetic terms of each of these, uh, of these fields. So now we're ready to finally show what the anomalous dimension matrix looks like. And here I'm going to show you the results for diagonal Yukawas and uh, effective uh, couplings, just to make it easier. That's why the Yukawas and these effective couplings come with uh, only one index. Uh, but in the, in the paper we show the, for a, a general flavor, flavor structure. So let's look at first at the upper part of this matrix, which uh, shows the beta function of the, of the Yukawa-like uh, operators. And we see that we have mixing with basically every effective operator. So we have maximum mixing here. Uh, in fact, if we look at this particular uh, term here, we see that we have here the Yukawa row uh, summing over all the flavors in each of the, of the effective couplings. So we'll actually even have intergenerational mixing. So the coupling to the top can generate the, the coupling to the gap through running. Now, if we look at the lower part, which gives us a bit of function of the, the, the couplings of the ALP to gauge bosons, the picture is quite different. Um, we see a lot of zeros and not, not a lot of mixing or no mixing at all. So the, the, the left-handed part, we could have set to zero a priori through non-renormalization theorems, which tell us that the, these Yukawa-like operators could never uh, normalize the, the, the coupling to, of ALP to gauge bosons. And looking at the, the right-handed part, we see this diagonal here, which means that there's no mixing and that uh, each coupling runs proportionally only to themselves. So what this means is that if it is zero at some point, then it will always uh, be zero. Actually, in the literature, it's common to write these couplings in this way, so to factorize the corresponding gauge coupling, uh, because this factor that we calculated here comes only from the running of the, of the corresponding gauge coupling, and by factorizing it this way, we can say that the CGG does not run. So it's scale invariant. In our case, we didn't do this. And so we get these terms here in the matrix. Okay, so having everything calculated above the electric scale and knowing how our couplings uh, vary with energy in this, uh, in this region, we are now ready to go below the electric scale and, and calculate the normalization group equations here. And so to do this, we're going to write the most general possible theory uh, in the left, by left, I mean the low energy effective field theory, which is the standard model after integrating out the W, Z, Higgs, and the top quark. So the most general theory is the left and an axion-like particle. What I mean by most general theory, I mean that I'm not worried about what's happening above the electric scale. So I do not care what the UV completion above the electric scale is, and I'm going to, to construct all possible operators up to dimension five in the left plus alpha. Only then, after calculating the normalization group equations, will I show the conditions to match at the electric scale to the theory that we've been uh, discussing so far. So to the theory of the SMEF plus the ALP. Since we're going to very low energies, eventually we're going to pass by the, the energies equal to the mass of, the, of fermions. And so we also have to integrate out these fermions as we pass by their energy thresholds. So this is the, the basis that we construct uh, uh, in the left plus the alpha at dimension five. And here I'm going to call the C couplings will be couplings that, are, uh, that come with dimension four operators, whereas A couplings come with dimension five uh, operators. And here in the left, we see that unlike before, we have dimension four operators that couple the alp to the, the standard model fermions. And we also have at dimension five, purely smeft operators, these dipole operators, which will be uh, very interesting as we'll see uh, later. 
Again, as before, we also have redundant operators that need to be uh, removed through equations of motion. And here I'm going to talk specifically about this redundant operator of the, of the standard model. We'll also have redundant operators with the out, but uh, uh, they're not very so interesting as this one, which has a certain subtlety when getting rid of it. So we can turn this uh, covariant derivative into the slash covariant derivative and a term that will give us contributions to the dipole and then apply the equations of motion to the uh, to the, this slashed covariant derivative. Here are the equations of motion that we would uh, that we would apply. However, what we did is that we conveniently chose to split the the covariant derivative in this manner here that we see, and we can do this because this this is equivalent to to what we had before through integration by parts. So we can do this. And in this way, we will apply the equations of motion to the right and to the left-handed uh, quark. And at the end, what we get is a contribution, after applying the equations of motion, we get a contribution of this form to the kinetic term of the, of the formulas. However, if we had not chosen uh, to split the covariant derivative in this manner and apply directly the equations of motion, we would get a, a different result. And so it would seem that we have an apparent ambiguity uh, on the way we apply the equations of motion. However, we show in our paper, and it has also been uh, discussed in this, uh, in this work by Jenkins, Manuel, and Stoffer, that this is just an apparent ambiguity and that it can be resolved after the appropriate chiral rotations uh, to the formulas. But why did we choose to, to split the covariant derivative in this manner? Well, we chose it because uh, as, I, as I said, this gives a contribution to the wave function normalization, so to the kinetic term of the fermions, and we see it here. And actually, after calculating the exact uh, factor that R must be, the coefficient that R must be, we see that it exactly cancels out direct contributions that we would get from the insertion of the dipole, which would come from diagrams such as this. So we see here that we have an insertion here of a dimension five operator, the dipole, and, gives, and it will give the uh, divergent contribution to the kinetic term of the, the electrons in this case. And this happens for all fermions. So by choosing uh, to split the covariant derivative in that manner, it becomes, uh, this, ca this cancellation uh, occurs instantaneously. And so we have only two, only contributions of dimension four to the wave function normalization of the fermions. Another interesting uh, effect that we see only happening in the left is the fact that uh, effective operators, so dimension five operators, can renormalize lower dimensional uh, operators. And this happens through insertions of masses that we now have in the, in the low energy effective field theory. Here I'm showing you the, the beta function of the dimension four coupling of the alt to, to the electron. And in the first line, we just get contributions which are dimension four, five, four sorry, Contribution. So insertions of three uh, dimension for coupling. So everything is okay here and equal to what we saw before. However, in these two lines, we see contributions that come from inserting one dimension five operator, in this case, the, the coupling to the, the gauge bosons that come obviously with a mass, with a mass insertion. So for instance, this contribution would come from this diagram here and then we would get contributions of the, the dipole operators that would come from, from diagrams such as these ones here. In the same, uh, in the same vein, we also get uh, contributions to the mass of the fermions that uh, again will come with a, with a mass insertion if we're talking about dimension four contributions and with two mass insertions if we're talking about dimension five uh, contributions. Actually, you'll also have a contribution to the running of the, the mass, in this case of the electron, with insertion of mass of the mass of the ALP, which come from the, comes from this, uh, this diagram here. Um, a, 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 another interesting uh, aspect of uh, the left is that, unlike what we saw before, that the coupling of the ALP to gauge bosons did not run in the in the smeft, so it was only did not run. Sorry, it only ran proportional to itself, so it did not have any mixing with other effective operators. 
when we go to the left, we see that now we do have mixing of the, of the, the coupling of the optic gauge bosons to other effective couplings. In this case, to the dipole operators, which are these terms here. And these are just proportional to, to itself, so to the, the coupling of the optic gauge bosons. The interesting part of this is that we can have a theory in which the, the coupling of the optic gauge bosons is zero at some scale, but it would be generated through mixing with other effective, uh, effective operators. We also have here the dependence of the number of fermions of the theory. And this has to do with the fact that as we go lower and lower in, in energy, we're going to integrate out each, each fermion. And so we get this, this dependence of the number of fermions of our, of our theory. This comes from the, the wave function normalization of the photons. So everything that I've been discussing so far in the left, as I mentioned, does not care about the UV completion, um, about the UV completion above the, the electric scale. So we're just considering all possible operator with all possible uh, couplings and see how they run. However, we're also, we're interested in the, the possibility that above the electric scale, apart from the standard model, we, also, we only have the ALP. And so we perform this matching and we see that some of the couplings that we've been talking about are not generated uh, at least at three level uh, when matching to the, to the SMEF plus the ALP. Uh, for example, we do not generate the dimension five coupling of the ALP to the, to the fermions, which could be expected to be generated through, a, through integrating out the Higgs in a diagram like this. However, we see that this will give us a contribution with, which, co which goes with one over, la one, one over V squared. And now the VEV is actually the, the high energy scale. And so this is higher order in the low energy power accounting. And we're going to neglect uh, this sort of contributions. We also do not generate the, the dipole operator in this, uh, in this matching. However, I want to stress that different completions above the electric scale could generate uh, all of these couplings. For example, if we were working with a SMEFT up to dimension six, we could indeed generate the, the, the dipole operator. So with all of, this, uh, all of these calculations done, now we want to see how using the normalization equations can be useful to interpret the, the experimental bounds. And to do this, uh, let, me, let us start by focusing on a, a particular model of the ALP, which is a photophobic ALP, in which the, the ALP does not couple to the, to the photon or to, or to other fermions uh, at high energy. So we will only get couplings to uh, the, the, the Z and the W. Despite its simplicity, this model has been uh, predicted in, in, composite, in the Compositix framework. And to search for this uh, directly uh, for the ALP in this context, one of the searches that we could, could look for uh, at colliders would be to look for the, the mono Z event, so PP going to Z uh, and missing energy. And what was seen is that the, the bound that we can, uh, we can get at uh, at the LHC at high luminosity would be around 0.04, the inverse of the TEV. However, sorry, yeah. Uh, this is the, the analysis that would do, that, will, that, that this reference bases itself to do this prospect for the, the high luminosity. This is a CMS analysis, which, which is searching for uh, a Z plus missing energy and reconstructing the Z with two, two leptons, either the electrons uh, or the muons. And here we can see this, what we're interested in is this, uh, this blue line, which gives us the signal for the, the, the missing energy that would come from the, the Z plus the ALP. And these are all the, the backgrounds from the standard model. This was done at very, very low luminosity. So this, this analysis was recasted by this reference and we got uh, the, the previous result of uh, 0.04, the inverse of the TEV, as the bound for the coupling on the ALP and, Z, and the Z boson. Okay, so uh, as we saw before, through mixing, we're, we can only with the coupling of the ALP to the, to the Z boson, we can indeed generate other, uh, other couplings in our theory. So this mixing 
can actually generate the coupling of the ALP2 electrons. So we can start with the coupling of the ALP2 electrons being zero at a high energy, as we saw in the photophobic ALP, but through the running of uh, the other couplings, we can generate this, uh, this coupling, which will be very important from the experimental level. Uh, and I, I'm showing here the beta, beta function of the Yukawa-like coupling of the ALP and the electrons. And we see that we have here terms that, are, that give us the mixing to the, the coupling of the, to the B and the W. And actually, we do have some very strong constraints on the coupling of the ALP to electron that come through the anomalous red giant cooling, which is an experiment at the key V, uh, which gives us bound at the key V scale. So how do we translate this bound on the electrons to the bound on the ALP to ZZ at high energies? And so to do this, what we need to do first is to get uh, what bound we have of the, the ALP2 electrons at very low energy. And then we'll run in the left, as we saw before, to get what this, uh, what this bound is at the electric scale. And in the meantime, as we pass through, ma uh, through fermions masses thresholds, we need to, to match uh, the theories with different numbers of, of fermions. Then when we have this bound at the electric scale, we will match it to get the bound on the Yukawa-like uh, operator coupling of the up to electrons, which is the, the operator of, uh, of the standard of the Smith plus up theory. And then by numerically solving the normalization group equations of the Smith plus the Alp, we can calculate what the coupling of the Alp to the Z boson can be so that as it runs, it generates the bound that we calculated on the coupling of the Alp to the electron. And this gives us a much stronger bound on the, on the, on the coupling of the ALP to the Z, to the Z boson, 4.8 times to 10 to the minus six, which when we compare to the, the previous bound that we obtained through direct searches, we get four orders of magnitude better than what uh, the direct bounds gave us. So obviously this, uh, this bound must be taken with a, the grain of salt because this is an indirect bound and we have some assumptions on the model and what sort of uh, new physics exists in order to, to, to use it. So direct bounds in this sense are always uh, important. However, for certain specific models, uh, we can get much better uh, constraints when considering the renormalization group equations as we show here. For this particular uh, case, the, the part of running in the, the low energy theory is not very important. It only has an effect of about 6%. So it can just be taken as a, an error when one just uses the, the SMEF to run the, the theory. However, take into consideration that this is a very simple model and other uh, completions can generate all couplings. And so we can have different uh, effects in the left. So one needs to actually make this calculation to make sure that the effect in the, in the left is important or not important. Another interesting uh, uh, model uh, which can be probed using the renormalization group equations is the top philic ALP. So the, the idea of an ALP that only couples to the, the top quark. So here, uh, through this coupling here. Again, we know that th through mixing with the electron uh, coupling, we can also generate this, uh, this coupling, even if it's zero at high energy. And so again, following exactly the same procedure as before, we're going to get a bound that is about 4.3 times to 10 to the minus six, the inverse of the TeV through use of this renormalization group equations applied to the bound on the anomalous cooling of red giants. Uh, th this particular bound is very difficult to probe directly at collider, so one would have to look at PP to TTS. And this is a very challenging final state. So the best bounds that we found were actually also indirect bounds that come from the chromomagnetic moment of the top quark, and which gives us a, a bound of around the inverse of the TeV. So using the renormalization group equations, we could get a bound that is six orders of magnitude uh, better than the, the previous one. So in conclusion, uh, I hope that I've showed you uh, the importance of using the renormalization group equations in order to correctly interpret the experimental bounds, uh, particularly in the case of the ALP in which we have uh, experimental bounds from very different uh, energy scales. 
And also using this renormalization group equations, we can study mixing effects between the different effective couplings, which can have very interesting uh, uh, phenomenological constraints and allow us to be uh, to constrain much more than just the direct, uh, direct bounds. We also looked at, at uh, what happened if we included the running on the left, and we saw that in some, in some cases, we can, this can lead to very interesting new, qualitatively different phenomenological results, such as the generation of the coupling to the, of the ALP to gauge bosons. So my, my final message then is to, it's to, to say that while we obviously always need direct, uh, the direct searches and direct bounds to get uh, good constraints on our uh, on new physics, using this renormalization group equations allows us to get even more, much more constraining uh, power to specific models once you consider this running and uh, possible mixing. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you very much, Guillaume, for this very interesting talk. We have some time for questions right now. Please raise your hand or just speak up. If there's no questions, I have one in your slide 31. This is, you say that, that, that there's strong constraints coming from the from the cooling of, of red giants. So, so, you, so people are, there's data from people, these red giants, you mean the stars, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yes. so but do you know what, what do they look exactly? So they look at the spectrum and, and how, the, the, how does this constraint directly your? No, actually what, the, what they are looking for here is that uh, with this, if the ALP indeed exists, then it would uh, give us a, an extra source of energy loss okay. in, the, in the energy, in the core of the, the star. So the ignition of helium would start later. And so you would have brighter stars existing in the red giant branch. Well. And so the, you have, uh, uh, by, by the experiments looking for the brightness in, uh, in, red giant, in the red giant branch, you can see the maximum uh, extra energy loss that you can have extra, I mean, extra to the standard model. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you a, a constraint on the coupling of the ALP to the electrons. Very, very interesting. Thank you. More, more questions? So you had a very clear seminar. I, I have just one, one other curiosity. I think it's on your first slides, uh, uh, the 14, when you talk about the, the manual checks to the, mm -hmm. that, that one. Yeah, so here I see that, that you, you use uh, fine, fine arts to, 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 to draw the, the, the diagrams, but then when you do the manual, the manual check, you change to, 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 K -graph, to K graph, right? Yes, yes. Is there any specific particular reason for that? Uh, no, not really. So the, 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 what happened was that we had not, when we started doing the manual checks, we had not yet used the fine arts and fine okay. So we were just using QGraph. <laughs> but then when we went to the actual computation and uh, we okay. used fine arts and form calc together so to make it more straightforward. Okay, very, very, very nice. Very nice. Okay, last chance. Questions? Okay, if not, thank you, Guilherme, for this technical but very interesting seminar. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, see you next week. Bye. Thank you.